Hello everyone, welcome to another session of Exploration Tech. My name is Jared Heckbart, I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Brilliance. And we have a really fun topic to hit on, both because it's with one of our favorite customers and our flagship platform. Uh, really looking forward to diving into content management and, and what Kat has, has learned in her journey with the Optimize the tool set. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Lori and let her introduce herself. Hi, yes, I'm Laurie McDonald. I'm the founder and CEO of Brilliance Business Solutions. My A quick bit about our story. Um, I started Brilliance in 1998. Uh, before I started Brilliance, what most people remember about me is that I worked at NASA Johnson Space Center as a flight controller for the space shuttle program, which was a super fun experience. Um, I ended up meeting my husband there. He uh, also was a flight controller at NASA, and he eventually went to work for Rockwell Automation. Uh, where he managed their largest data warehouse. And it was through that role that we ended up relocating to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1998, and where I was trying to figure out what could be as cool as space. And so I decided to start a web development company. Uh, and through uh, my husband Dave's experience at Rockwell, he interfaced with a lot of Rockwell distributors, and we realized that we were kind of uniquely equipped to work with manufacturers and distributors and helping them to implement digital commerce solutions. So that's what we developed as our niche. And as we grew, we became partners with Episerver, now Optimizely, back in 2013, um, and have uh, really enjoyed um, the, the power of that platform as a part of the solutions that we bring to our customers. And as Jared referenced, really excited about the conversation that we're having here today. Uh, Neogen became a customer of Optimizely and Brilliance back in, I think it was in 2019. And, and Kat, you and I met um, met in person. I was really excited to meet in person this recently this summer as we were celebrating some of the work uh, together that we've had. But I've been hearing about you from my team for a while about what 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 an awesome team member and contributor you are and how much you know. Um, and so really excited to have you as a guest on here with us today to, to share uh, your knowledge and tips with others. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. And it's exciting to be here. And thanks for the opportunity to let me talk about some of these technical things that hopefully other geeks like me will find helpful. So my background with like any web related items, um, it started back in the early 2000s, kind of when internet was wild west almost. Started with creating layouts in MySpace and LiveJournal and messing with that kind of code. During that time, I viewed it just as a hobby doing graphic design and making all those things. I started going to college actually in music education, like so completely different. It wasn't until about a year and a half later, I realized I want to go back to doing what was a hobby and actually what I enjoyed doing. So I switched gears and went into web design and ended up getting a degree in that from a local college. And then, during that time while I was getting my degree, I also did restaurant management for a hot second, started from the bottom, worked my way to the top. But after a while, had to get back in that digital sphere because it kept drawing me back in, like I can't get away from it. Since I had gotten the degree, I worked at a couple of different companies just kind of in their technical team or answering questions kind of as a consultant, not like full-fledged consultant, but you know, people came to me asking, well, how do I make a website? Where do I go? What do I do? And so a lot of that has been kind of off paper as far as my expertise and working with different platforms, whether it's, you know, Joomla or Drupal, definitely WordPress, which a lot of people have. And then when I started at Neogen in December of 2016, we were on mainly the Joomla platform and I was part of the web communications department. Um, I was part of that team for the first three years, and then fast forward to 2019, and we started onboarding Optimizely, Happy Server at the time. And obviously, there's been a lot that's happened in the last three years, but that's kind of where we're at today. So, yeah. Awesome. Really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, before we we jump into it, a couple housekeeping items. If you have some questions for us as we continue the conversation, feel free to jump in and punch them into the chat box. We'll do our best to address those. Uh, throughout. Uh, also, if you get a minute, I'd highly recommend you follow Neogen on the, their LinkedIn profile. Also, check out their website. Uh, and uh, we'd appreciate a follow on the Brilliant site as well. Kat, I, I assume you're open to a connection on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can find Lori and myself there too. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So let's let's get into the meat of it. Uh, Lori, do you want to yeah. kick it off? Yes. Yeah. And actually, before we get into talking about uh, Kat, your your tips and recommendations for people, I'd love to share with our audience some background on NeoGen's digital journey and 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 let you share a little bit more about your role within that journey. So NeoGen works to protect and improve food and animal safety around the world. And NeoGen has seen a lot of growth through acquisition that resulted in a, you know a variety of tech stacks. That, that can make it challenging for IT and marketing. And Neogen had several divisions with separate websites and that kind of resulted in a disjointed experience for end users and also has a global need. So, you know, Neogen has teams in 12 countries, a sales presence in 140. And so all of that was really a part of what was driving um, the selection of Optimizely Commerce Cloud then, then called Episerver in 2019 to bring those multiple divisions into one digital experience and to enable them to, you know, you to grow that digital experience globally. So Kat, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about your role in that digital journey for Neogen and, and also feel free to fill in pieces of the Neogen story that I, I may have missed. Like what I first said, I first started with Neogen. It was with a very small web team in a more IT focused approach. We were still part of communications, but we had obviously some layover and some overlap with that. We would receive change requests from various stakeholders and we would implement those changes. So it was a very kind of IT ticket system almost. When we started onboarding to Optimizely, we still served that kind of role um, because we knew where all the old data lived on the site. So we, even though we were the tech nerds in the basement, we knew where the bodies were buried, you know? So we had we were very essential in trying to get all that old content, not old, all that content from all the old sites into the new platform. When we started using the platform more and more, whether it was onboarding different divisions and business units, uh, creating more marketing campaigns. The people that were the implementers started getting pulled in more for a technical perspective. What can the site do? What can it do? But the biggest way that the role changed from what I'm doing then versus now is getting more involvement into that creation and what that whole digital journey looks like. And my, this role started becoming more into the marketing side rather just than just the IT side. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about your story is that I notice in you, even as you describe your background, that you've got elements of your personality that are more creative and also more technical, which I, I identify with. And also, I think for many organizations, what they find is that really a lot of executing on marketing requires technical skills. There's like this blended skill set that's really necessary to execute on it well. As you've worked on the Neogen site in Optimizely, I'm curious what you've seen as the difference for your team's efficiency now that you're using Optimizely compared to before, and if there are things that you can do today that wouldn't have been possible in the past. Yeah, a couple of the biggest things that made us more efficient was the ability to use centralized blocks, forms, elements, whatever you want to call that, and the second one being translation of pages. When on the first one with centralized content, if you have, for example, a standard contact form, you ask these five questions, you have it formatted first name, colon, last name, you know, very specific. You don't need to recreate the wheel. You can build that form and then you can utilize that across the site in multiple spots. And if you need to make a change to the content, it will change on every page that that piece of content is on. So strictly speaking from a form perspective, our old site, we had so many different regions, different languages. It, like it was, that was one of the first things when we were looking at it, like, I need to figure out how to solve this problem that we had previously. And this helped that tremendously. With the translation piece, we use a, obviously a third party translator, but they have a connector that connects to Optimizely and their platform. We're able to send bits and pieces if anything gets updated or full pages and it comes right back without us having to like re-implement anything and don't need a bunch of word documents per language per page it just got rid of a lot of that clutter and was able to be way more efficient in that process it saved us a lot of time yeah that's great i mean it's all efficient saving time is excellent because it lets you spend time on other things that are going to drive more value In a previous exploration tech session, we had a marketer on that Lori and I both highly respect named Ted Fay. And we talked about the composition of a marketing team and really building out a successful marketing team. 
But where we, we didn't hit was on marketing teams that are you know, made up of a collective of a, a you know, small group of people. So can you talk just about the size of your team and, and what you have found to work best to drive the most efficiency and, and accomplish the most? Absolutely. Our team has been shaped in a way that gives us a room to be experts in our field. I do want to thank my mentor, Jennifer, for structuring us that way. I like to think of this structure as a race where the first leg is at the higher level where we collectively would work with stakeholders to get the what that needs to be changed or implemented and make sure that it fits the why, like in our branding and all that. Once it's in a good spot to be handed off, it's passed to the next stage where we figure out the how, which is where I kind of am in that process. Yeah. So we figure out what we need to do and then we figure out how we need to do it. And after it's executed, there's follow up, obviously, on reporting. What metrics did we want to report on? What KPIs did we need to measure? So that's like the third part of it. And as far as being efficient, uh, we use a project management tool that's been crucial with keeping everything in line since it crosses over potentially different departments in different regions. So it's helped us to keep everything on track and have everybody on the same page and know what's going on in that process. Uh, I, we, we can definitely attest to project management tools being key to success internally here at Brilliance as well. So that, that's very interesting coming from the, the marketing perspective. What would you recommend as uh, to a, to another content marketer out there who's leveraging the Optimizely platform, you know, in a similar role to yours? Uh, wh what should they be learning uh, as far as Optimizely content management tools go? Well, Optimizely does have a user guide, and I highly recommend reading through it. Hopefully, it's not a boring read. Hopefully, it's an exciting read for people. And as far as how you want to go about parsing that information, maybe you do it by the topic that you're working on or you try to read it front to back. I'm not sure, but they have a great guide that I reference multiple times. They have a lot of resources to whether it's using the CMS editor or the development of the CMS itself. Like they do have a good support system. Also, check the differences between how your site is set up versus what that user guide shows. Your results may vary. There's sometimes where it's like, well, our site's not totally structured like this, but the key points are there. So just kind of know what the differences are between their examples and what your site does. If possible, if you can have a test environment to play around in, I highly recommend that. I'm a hands-on person. I try to break things. You don't know how far you can go until you try to break the tools that are given to you. And that helps you optimize and tweak certain elements if you need going down the road. A big one is establishing templates and guidelines. Like in my role, since I've been at the beginning of this and kind of got to see its creation, I do understand a lot more of what the site can do, but you know, trying to talk to stakeholders or higher leadership, that might be too much for information for them all at once. Like this block can do 20 billion things. It's like, well, here's a template and let's go from there and we can build on that as time progresses. I highly recommend leveraging, reusing blocks and elements when possible. Don't need to create a whole bunch of the same information on different pages. And then not optimizely specific, but just in general, if you find yourself being a person that is in these backend systems, learning that little bit of HTML for the WYSIWYG editors and all that when you're putting content in, you know, if you know why spacing looks off for this little piece of content, like just, you don't need to be a full stack developer, but knowing how HTML works at a fundamental level will help you in the long run. Yeah. Those are great tips. You've referenced a few times, like kind of understanding and op optimizing structure. And I just wonder if it would be helpful to our viewers really quickly to cover a few things in, in case people aren't familiar with Optimizely CMS. So here's an example from Brilliance's site of a page type. And so within Optimizely, structure of pages are defined 
in a way that enables marketers to edit within the CMS specific properties fields. So you'll see here it says down to earth team out of this world results. That's text that's here in this header text. And the way it's displayed is controlled by the team that's implementing the view of that page. And so to your point, Kat, like it's important for content marketers to understand some of those decisions that are going to be made about page design so that they can give input to what areas are, are going to be necessary to have editable and what things that you want to really have control the view of that lockdown more. And obviously those are areas where, you know, like brilliance as a system implementer will get involved with customers and help guide that discussion. But the more you understand of it, the better. I know the other thing you referenced, Kat, was wanting to leverage reusable blocks and so that people can kind of understand and picture what that means. This is an example of blocks that are used on brilliance's solution page. So, you know, we can fill in the content of what's in that blocks and the way it's displayed is controlled again by how developers have set this up to be viewed. These blocks in this instance are local to that specific page, but blocks also can be global where you, you know, set them up in a, a right-hand pane within your optimized like, content editing experience. And then you can use that same block on hundreds, thousands of pages. And when you edit it once, you've made that edit everywhere. And I think Kat, that, that's one of the things you were referring to in terms of efficiency, that this really can help drive that efficiency. I know in our prep call for today, you had referenced, you know, you've used a, a, a couple different translation services, and I'd love to learn more mm -hmm. about, you know, what are the differences for you today, as well as, you know, how much does having a translation service really save you, or, or maybe even a step further, like what to you are the benefits of leveraging a service like this? Yeah, and speaking for website translation specifically, you know, our old way was you produce a Word document, here's the content on the page, we would send it out, it would come back to us six different files, one for each language, so we're juggling so many different Word documents. And then even worse is we built everything by hand, we re-implemented it. Our old site wasn't much of a database, but it was here's the page and here's the code which is just HTML, but you still had to build all that by hand. A lot of the team's resources went into building these pages. But with Optimizely, like I said, we can send full pages or just bits and pieces if it gets updated through the connector. And for the most part, it comes back to us without further implementation. It's kind of one and done. It did take some trial and error, obviously, when we first onboarded for that initial startup and that setup. But once those were worked out, it's proved to be much more efficient, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, the efficiency of that. I mean, versus having to have a lot of Word docs that you're having to implement is really exciting. Uh, Kat, one of the things that I've heard you talk about is needing to plan ahead for what elements of the site you're going to mm -hmm. Uh, have available in different languages and not. And this is an example of how some of those decisions were made for this block where, you know, the, the image itself that's used here doesn't need to be culturally specific. So it doesn't need to be different for different regions. And that was a choice that your team made, but that, you know, this title, these the word that says beef here does. And so, you know, we can look at the same page in German and, and see that you know the image is the same, but the the text is different. And wanting to think through what elements of that block are going to be different. This is kind of an example of of that, like thinking through fields and what things are going to be localized and not. Kind of related to that, Kat. I'm just curious, like as you work with Optimizely in a translation service, what kinds of tips would you have for organizing and thinking through what you're submitting to that translation service? Well, like you just previously said, the biggest thing is before you start sending it out is you need to check the properties of these blocks. This was a little bit of that trial and error that we found because we didn't have to necessarily dig this deep before, so we didn't have to really worry about it, but there was a couple of times where it's like, oh, we don't need this image translated. We need to turn this off. We don't need it to be localized, but if you can get that prep work, you know, learn from my mistake, you're gonna save your time in the long run if you look at those properties of those page types or those blocks. And then another one is the naming of the blocks. When you send out content for translation, in my experience, you can send out full pages and the blocks that are contained within that page. So you'll want to have a good naming structure so you can kind of keep track 
of what is being sent out. When you build a block, this is a new development in Optimizely, but it generates a name for you. And I have my own feedback, but you can change it, but it would be nice to be able to set that from the get go instead of having to get re back into the element and rename it. But name your blocks, having some kind of naming structure that is consistent. So if someone needed to follow up after you, they know what is being translated. Depending on how you built your pages and your blocks, translate only the elements that you need because we want flexibility to have multiple blocks within a block. Some of those, we call them container blocks and you don't technically need to send that for translation because there's no content to be translated. So kind of goes back to that's why you name your blocks so you know exactly what is being translated. The concept of the local versus global forms in the blocks, um, we're using those global forms and form fields so you have to translate first name once and then you don't have to resend that out for translation. And then you're sending the page, you remove those items in the translation file that have already been translated. It's like, you don't need to retranslate that form, you don't need to resend it, because then you're just gonna potentially spend more money already translating something that's already been translated. Great tips from someone who traveled that path. So thanks, Kat, that's great. So as someone who's responsible largely for content changes on our Optimizely instance, I'm very interested to hear about how you handle incoming requests for changes to your content on, on your site, knowing that, you know, we're a small group, you have different business units, that, you know, requesting changes and whatnot. Very interested to hear your perspective and how you manage that today. Well, Luckily, I mean, it would, it takes a village. It can't be one person. I can't, there's no way. But luckily we have someone in the team to resource that kind of, those requests coming in and they come into a queue because, I mean, sometimes they come off as one-off emails directly to me, but we direct them like, nope, you have to put it in the queue because there might be more to it than what you are asking for. And then it gets put into our project management system where it can get folded in and it gets vetted at the higher level and then it'll get back down to me. We just want to make sure that that what and the why are applicable of why they want to change content. Once it's figured out, we move forward with like the technical requirements and scoping of that because sometimes not all the inputs that are required in the initial request make it. Like we want to add an image. What's the image? Is there going anywhere? Like there are things that I might still have further questions on. So we go to that next kind of stage as we scope out, okay, how do we get there? Like with any new process, it takes time to get it all hammered out, but we found that to be effective is kind of that funneling system, that relay race, if you will. Yeah. Well, Brilliance Marketing Team, if you're listening, get ready to, uh, well, you should be listening, get ready to adopt the what, why, how approach. Uh, I love that, that that's fantastic. That's great, great process. So Kat, I know the Brilliance and Neogen teams have been working together for a while and there's been work adjusting some of the existing blocks and page types to be more flexible, give more control to the content administrator. So I'm curious, how um, has that increased flexibility changed the way you, you build page, pages and if there's any challenges that kind of have come along with that increased flexibility? The process of building the pages hasn't really changed. You implement it the same way. We just have more features to play with now. The challenges that came with this is when we configured the blocks and elements that we have not used before. Once it gets on page, we see that there might be need to be tweaks to spacing or kind of font issues or small things like that because we had never configured it that way with those kind of blocks. When we think of how we want to put a new type of content on the site, we look at it that way and then down the road like okay we have these other toys to play with let's try it here and then we realize well this is a different use case now and there might be tweaks that need to be made so the flexibility is great but you know there's always fine tuning that comes with that yeah and i think that's just really great to understand the trade-offs that exist between you know you can have something that's really kind of locked down in terms of how it's going to look and, and what can be edited so that you know exactly what it's going to look like or you can have things that enable you to make a lot more changes create a very different looking page but to your point then there can sometimes be additional tweaking that needs to happen to get the spacing right or other elements on the page so great points
we promised tips and uh, I know we have a few guests here who are who are just starting out with Optimizely. So I'd love for you to be able to maybe take a second, think back to when you just started with the platform and maybe suggest some time-saving tips to those individuals. Yeah, I've been told that the results are in the planning. So, you know, have an idea of what your media or your page structure is gonna look like. Even if you're not the one that is totally in charge of that area, it will be, you need kind of need a plan and understand how it needs to be structured. But it could change, so you have to be flexible with that because new types of PDFs, for example, you have different types of literature. Where does that fit? Did you plan ahead enough time so you have like those, that structure in place? A big one is understanding that optimize these like media slash block folder structure. They are both one and the same. So let's say you had a folder called banners, like you have a folder where all your banners live. If you're in the block section, you can have all of your banner blocks that could be there. Or if you're in the media portion of that, that could be where all the images live for your banners. It can be useful or it can be cumbersome. It just depends on how your images are used. If we made an image specifically for the banner block, then it would make sense to keep it there. But there could be times, depending on how your site is structured and what you want to do, is that image might be used for other than a banner. So if you wanted to try to find that image again, it's in your banner section, but does it need to be in a global, a different kind of structure? We went with a more traditional structure where all the blocks kind of lit, like here's the blocks, and they don't get intermingled with media because we might use those images for something for a different type of block. So understanding how that kind of works and you could go either way. You can keep it, you can have media um, and blocks still have that, share that same structure or you can space it out or split it out a little bit. And then going to your page structure hierarchy, sometimes it's just scoping of the initial page being created, but knowing how they should live together um, in one of our instances, you'll have a page where they fill out a form and then they go to a second page that's like a thank you page. Here's more information. Having the thank you page nested underneath. So your URL would be landing page slash thank you. Keeping the content kind of together instead of just one off pages. Having the plan in advance is I think the most important. And you know, if you need to write it down or have it in a PowerPoint slide and have a template, it'll help anyone new coming into that. Those are all fantastic tips. I'm sorry to say we're actually at time, but I do want to give both of you an opportunity to add any closing thoughts. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us, Kat. This has been great. Well, my closing would just be uh, how much I appreciate you spending this time with us, Kat. And on the whole, all of your feedback and tips here speak to the capability that's there to really be a time saver and also the benefit of, of planning and really understanding the tools to get the most out of it. Thanks for having me. And it was fun to kind of talk and geek out about these things. At yeah. first, I was like, do I have enough things to talk about? But as you see, like, we could have another segment if needed. We totally could, and we would love it. This has been great. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as I said at the beginning, love for you to give Brilliance a follow as well as Neogen on their LinkedIn pages. Uh, feel free to connect with us all individually on LinkedIn as well. Uh, we'll be sending out a recording of the session here shortly. And uh, any other questions that come up, you know you know how to reach us. Kat, do you want to sing us out? You want to you want to put that music degree? In? I'm just kidding. I don't want to put you on the spot. All right, everybody. Have a good planning. Yeah, no. <laughs>